Welcome, everybody, to this episode of Breaking Absolutes. Uh, I'm really thrilled today to ha- uh, be able to have a conversation with Tom Englund. Um, before we get into the conversation with Tom, um, and, and I think sort of consonant with having Tom as a guest, let me re- remind folks of the sort of ethos of the show. Um, when, when I was approached by Amazon to do the show, I, I said I'd do it if I could do the kind of show I wanted to do. I didn't want to do a, a radio style show. Um, I wanted to have more, more extensive conversations with musicians with the idea that I talk to musicians that I believe are pushing the edges of the genre, the, the rock and metal genre, and that the things they're doing d- deserve a broader audience. And this comes with the sort of consequence of the, the, what may be healthy tension between um, metal community who don't want the music to become more mainstream, um, yeah, being that idea being at odds with the, the need of the music for the artists to, you know, be um, received well enough that they can make a living because we want them to keep making the music. And so my idea is I want more people listening to the music. I think the music deserves it. And so I bring artists on whose music I think it is in that place. Um, and Tom is in his writing with Evergrey and the, and the stuff with Redemption, I think, suits perfectly. So I, I was really excited that um, he was willing to come on the show. And so if you dig this approach that we're taking, um, then do the thing, uh, subscribe, follow, just so that we can continue to reach out to these kinds of guests and, and hopefully encourage them to be on the show. Um, let, me, let me frame up a little bit about um, Tom, um, if you don't know him. He founded Evergrey, uh, I think, in 1994. Um, they have released 12 studio records. Uh, I believe they've started recording on their 13th. That's a significant um, stat all by itself to have that kind of staying power uh, inside any music genre, let alone metal. Um, I began to look at chart positions, and pretty soon it became an exercise in ridiculousness to try and catalog all of the places that th- the music has uh, landed in the charts um, in multiple countries. Um, so I, I, and I, I'll give you a few, but suffice to say that, the, that as a measure of success or at least recognition inside the industry, the music um, has done that many, many times. Um, and, and I'll get to a few of those. Um, well, let me just give you a couple real quick. Um, Escape the Phoenix, Phoenix uh, hit the number 14 on the Metal Contraband charts, Billboard at number 77, um, the in the iTunes, da- iTunes download charts, it hit number ones and number twos and number threes um, all across Europe. Um, um, the International mal- Album Charts uh, in Sweden, number two, in France, number two. I just give you those so that you can see that um, the music sits at the same altitude with many of the bands that... Um, you know, we, we love and enjoy. Uh, and they're respected among their peers. I mean, they've toured with some of the, the biggest um, metal acts sort of in the scene. Um, they're known for, uh, and Tom's known for, and we'll talk to him about this, um, what, I, what I've come to call an emotional quotient inside the music, um, dealing with some um, consequential themes and doing it with, I think, both subtlety um, and respect. So with that as my frame up, let me bring Tom on, and we will just have our conversation directly with the man himself. Tom, welcome. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you and I are, I, it's morning time for me, and it's evening time for you. Uh, yeah. I'm just ca- starting to caffeinate, so uh, bear with me as I sort of come up to speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'm going, I'm slowing down, so it's all good. Oh, yeah. So that- be great <laughs> we'll find we'll find the same speed some somewhere in a, in a minute here um Probably. so you know before we get into some of the the music conversation i just like to take a pulse with the folks i talk to and how they've managed this whole covid situation for themselves uh well i mean of course when we went in i mean now it's now it's been going on for so long so i'm i'm used to it now it's yeah. it's more scary to start to think of about touring again and and all, all of that stuff so but i mean of course when it hit it was a, a total shutdown for us we uh, we haven't 
I mean, basically we haven't played for two years and, and, uh, but that all, on the other hand, gave us a lot of time to do other stuff and have time for the, 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 the projects and the, and the, the music we never have time for, yeah. uh, uh, you know, usually. So yeah, for me, it's been probably the most creative two years I've encountered so far in my musical life. So in that aspect, it's been, it's been all good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, of course there are other things that have, hasn't been that good. Yeah, I've I've actually heard that same same thing echoed by a number of musicians. Um, not that this is the way you'd like to have come by the time, but um, it's been nice to reconnect with family and nice to have n- no particular pressures or or um, deadlines to get some music done. Um, right. You guys have definitely been active, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, I have to tell you. Um, I have a I have a, a crazy affinity to your band name. This is a frivolous comment, but uh, I live in Seattle, Washington, and I call this the Evergrey State because it is cloudy all the time. All, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what it's like where you live, but um, yeah, I think we're on pretty much the same weather. I also live by the coast, and and uh, we have the. But the the great thing about being on the coast is that you can have bad weather like uh, inland, like. Yeah. Five minutes from here, it can be raining and I can have sunshine. So, yeah, uh, it, it's both negative and positive to be out here by the by the sea. So, yeah, yeah, I just uh, uh, I love your name because it um, immediately conjures images for me of the, the, the weather. Um, before we go, um, so let's start the music conversation. But I want to start first with your voice, um, it, it, you know. You've had a long career, 25 plus years. Um, and one of the things, there's many things that you are known for and that the music is known for, not the least of which is your voice. Um, so the, one of my natural questions, because we do have a lot of musicians that follow the channel is, did you ever do any sort of formal training or was it all self-taught? No, no formal tra- training at all. Not even, I mean, not when I started and still not to this day. I think, uh, and I think, I mean, uh, of course, I think training can be good in some aspects, but uh, I also think it's extremely important to find your own voice, yeah. uh, especially when singing, you know, because when you go to a, like a vocal coach, or they will start to peel off the things that are uh, your identity. And, and that was one of the things that I was very careful with from the beginning. So no, no training and uh, not either on guitar or, or uh, vocals. Do you, um, Having said that, do you make any effort when you get into touring or rehearsal to get the voice warm before you use it, or do you just use it by pra- uh, warm it by pra- by practicing itself? I mean, uh, during itself? tour, I, yeah, du- during tours, what I what I usually is the most careful about is, of course, drinking a lot of booze is uh, not helping uh, <laughs> the voice, uh, but uh, also not making too many interviews, to be honest, because talking to people all day long is is one of the things that sort of sort of wears me out the most yeah. uh so so that's one of the things that i want to keep to a minimum during tour which is super contraproductive in a way but uh, yeah. uh i mean we're five guys in a band and it's a band so so we try to divide it up as much as possible but other than that i just yeah i hum i hum uh, and like a half an hour before before show and 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 yeah that's that yeah that, that um i'm I'm happy to hear you make that comment. Um, I did the reason I moved to Seattle was to do vocal training um, with the guy that taught guys like Jeff Tate, and he had this line he always would repeat. He said, "Speaking is the enemy to the singer," um, mm-hmm. and so and I've heard many many vocalists, professional vocalists, say one of the things they'll do is keep down the amount of conversation they have during the day if they've got to sing that night. Um, yeah. So hearing you say that. Uh, it's very it's um and you came by that sort of a, as a natural wisdom um it's a good sort of uh, uh underscoring of that point so for vo- aspiring vocalists i think take note it's kind of I, I i imagine that's very hard for you where you've got press that do want to talk to you you've got um sound check you know so much that's going on on the tour um, yeah and, and bad sleep and all those things that you know are is not helping your voice at all. But uh, yeah. I mean, at that at the same time, I've been I've been doing this since I was 19 years old. So so for me, I also been sort of making my voice, teaching my voice to to sort of um, get by on those terms in a way. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. It is what it is. But 
for night if you go on tour for like whatever a month or two then it's uh it's draining to talk every day and and also sing every day you know yeah yeah it's um i think sometimes uh fans and uh even other musicians aren't um as cognizant of the number of sort of natural factors that affect the voice um and it makes it makes singers sound whiny but it's just it's just a state of affairs um all of which is to say um it's it's um it, it commends you well that you that you perform so well um, through uh, athletic material that you write for yourself to sing and the, the grueling nature of a tour um, given all of these things and, um, and and because your voice is one of the things that that gives your music its distinctive sound um, um, before we get into um, Evergrey, and, and I want to talk about a little bit about Redemption, too. I know you've done a whole bunch of collaborations, um, almost just too many to enumerate. I do want to ask you about um, Arion in particular. But I, but I noted, I think it was on one of your social media feeds, you had, you had said that during this COVID period, um, just because of the nature of people writing music, that you'd done a whole, a whole slew of, of uh I don't know if collaborations is the right term, but you've like w- helped other other musicians singing on their songs or whatever. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, basically, honestly, it was uh, w- when the COVID has been had been going on for like six months or so. Of course, we start to get short on money, <laughs> so yeah. I figured, uh, w- what what do I do? I, I sing and I write music, so I offered my services to anyone who was uh willing to to have me on their album basically so i think i did i think i did like 28 albums last year that i participated on so and at the same time also started writing uh music for uh, video games together with my maybe it's not called video games today what is it called uh games like uh yeah Yeah. major computer games uh and uh, i did that with my with my partner from another band called Vikram Shankar. So all these doors opened up for me that I wanted to explore, explore before and pursue before, but I, and now, and now I got the chance in a way. So, yeah. So I had many, many, many fans writing me, wanting me to be on their album, which is of course a great honor to have people wanting you on their albums and in their music. And you also get to step into their world of creativity and also step away from your own creativity and your, yeah. you know, and all, all that good stuff. So, yeah, it was extremely rewarding, I would say. And and so it basically was like people sent me the stuff. I listened to it. Then if I liked it, I did it. So and I had because I had the time. Usually I get these questions all year long, but I never have the time to do it. Yeah, I I, I think I heard you make a comment in an interview that um, it was it, one of the benefits of doing this is getting to uh, experience different types of songwriting and different types of songs that may even give you ideas for future music of your own. Is that accurate? Of course. Absolutely. I mean, every time I write a song, it's, it's a new learning experience for me and whatever song it might be. And then stepping into somebody else's songs and, and, and creative world, it's uh, you can sort of approach it in a different way. Yeah automatically you know because you don't have this for every gray or for silent skies or for redemption i have this sort of pre-constructed idea in my head that this is what i want to do and this is how it's going to sound but for uh, for other people's music i don't have that uh, they might have some ideas that we want you to sound like this in this song and you know and then they give examples of of every great songs or whatever but but uh, usually i just have free hands and can start from scratch and i mean totally from scratch which is yeah, as I said, very rewarding. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's one of the you know I'm gonna skip ahead to a question because I think it's germane here. But there's you guys have for a, a good portion of your career, by the industry, by journalists, um, been given been given the name or the label of a progressive metal band, and yeah. um, I think that there's a I read an, a, an interview you did probably 12 years ago where you weren't sure that that was a blessing. Um, you know, because unfortunately I think a lot of people, when they hear that term, their expectation of what the music is going to be 
is a very certain thing. It's it, it's become identified with bands like Dream Theater and a, a certain technical prowess. And I think that's an unfortunate reality because I, I think I think at its root, the idea of a progressive rock or metal band is a band that that takes liberties with um, the song construction. It's not about technical facility. N- not that not that your band or any other band in the in the progressive metal world doesn't have technical facility. Um, but I wonder, um, I wonder if you still feel that way about that language. Do you still feel like it, it sends a, a, maybe a, a not representative signal about the music that you make? But uh, yeah, but I also think that about every labeling of any kind of music. Yeah. You know, I don't want to, but at the same time, I do understand that humans want to be, you know, they need to put things in a box in order to understand it and in order to know beforehand that I'm not going to spend my 30 seconds of of my time on this because I don't like progressive music or, you know, hardcore metal or whatever it might be. So, yeah. and that's the exact problem. And because that also hinders them from, from listening to stuff that might actually appeal to them very much. I mean, this happens to us all the time that people watch us live for the first time on a festival or whatever. And they're just like, dude, I thought you played this and that. And, you know, I thought you sounded like this. And I thought, you know, uh, but I mean, for me, for, for me, it's like, and uh, I've stopped to bother with it because it doesn't, I, I can't change it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing on, on Spotify when you get sort of clustered up with um, among a bunch of other artists that doesn't necessarily like sound like you at all, you know? So, uh, and Evergrey has, uh, that's the great thing about Evergrey too. We're so sounding in so many different ways and in so many dynamic areas at the same time so it's it's you can't really label us so then people go for the easiest thing and yeah you know yeah no i 100 percent agree with you i think it's also a consequence sometimes of uh the company the record company um that marketing departments have to find ways to talk about the music um yeah. but but it does a band like you like evergreen in particular i think um that much more a disservice uh, you know and i may i don't know if, if i articulated this in my preamble but one of the things that um i hope this show does i want it to do is to break down stereotypes um so that we so that pe- people will kind of listen to the music and approach it because i think more people um could enjoy it than do based upon p- preconceptions they have and this is one of them um and your music defies that more more so than a lot of bands that are playing heavy guitar centered music because there's there's there is a fluidity with which you guys move between stuff that does sound more technical with a lot of crazy runs and transitions stuff that's just um more that has more of a a gothic or a a doom flavor stuff that's just great heavy metal um Mm. stuff that's very power metal um and 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 even beyond like the labeled approach um as i've listened to a bunch of your music uh, in preparation for this conversation, there's uh, your song construction is is uh, I think a strength of the band uh, because you it, you find ways to do to go in and out of um, um, feel uh, and and in and out of different um, I don't know how to say it it's 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 not an obvious song construction but it but it never feels disjointed uh, mm. and so the music has this this uh, it coheres. Even though the, the throughout the, the journey of any particular song, there's real change, so it and it's hard to define that with a label. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, yeah. and, and that's the problem they have, of course. And at the same time, we do have songs that are in a certain genre or whatever. Sure. But yeah, it's it's a it's a challenge for the marketing people of the label, and it's a. But I mean, if you can't spend thirty seconds on something and make up your mind, you might as well do something else. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, this... we, we're, not, we're not fast food metal here. We, we... <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, if you, if you don't have the time to spend, then you should listen to Britney Spears, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, <laughs> Which is fine. I love Britney Spears. So it's, you know, that's right. No, but you make a good point. Like there are even, even in metal, there are bands who have a very, very specific sort of sonic fingerprint. And that's what they do. They do it really well. Um, and you know exactly what you're going to get going in. And they, there's not a lot of deviation. But that's not what Evergrey is. 
Uh, and I think it's why you have such a rabid, like loyal following. Um, you know, the people who have found you uh, are they're fans for life. Um, mm. The way it, this is my perception looking in that it seems as though once someone's an Evergrey fan, like you, they, you know, they, you sit in the, at the center of their heart for forever. Um, so that must feel good. Um, of course. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's like, I've been doing this now for like a quarter of a century doing, and we're, the great thing about not being a huge band because Evergrey is not a huge band where we're semi, semi big, <laughs> semi small, but at the same time, we're still growing and we are yeah. still growing, which is insane to me, you know, to be sitting here. Like when I started this in 1994, I figured if I could do three albums by the time I would, you know, die, then I would be happy. And now we have done 12 with Evergrey alone. So it's like, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it, um, it is one of the points I wanted to make. Uh, Evidence of what you, of what you've just said exists in some of the, the numbers that I was giving earlier about um, uh, charts. Ex uh, successively, you guys chart better. Um, the The reception of your music, like there is, let's just be honest. There are bands who, um, for whatever reason, the deeper they get into the career, the, the music just doesn't seem to have the same vitality. You're you're going in the opposite direction the 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 um and this isn't just my feeling like this i did a lot of sort of reading your your fans and the critics mostly agree that the band just keeps getting better um which is i mean that's an exciting sort of um counterintuitive experience for for a metal band so very much that's yeah, very I mean, very cool it's yeah <laughs> I mean, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, of course, I would have been it would have been great to have a black album and have yeah. sold 500 million albums. But at the same time, we are still eager to do this now because we never earned so much money that you know made us tired and fatigued and old and fat. Well, fat we we got fat, <laughs> but then we starved, so we're back to thin again now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you know what, though, in, in your joke, there is a really important point, and that is there are a lot of bands who we kind of ha have sort of crossed over beyond sort of the metal community into a cultural consciousness on the strength sometimes of one song. Um, and what's good about that is once they do, then the fans will find a bunch of their other music, all right? And yep. so everything kind of lifts. Um, but bands who never have that one song or that one album – that break them, they kind of they kind of seem to ride this this middle level of success, which is not bad. It's just it's a big difference between Metallica and a lot of other bands. Of course, yeah. And I mean that's well, I mean that's one of the things that I'm again very grateful for. I mean we're as you said we have uh, we have fans that have been us from with with us from day one, but but we also have fans that got with us for the last album and. <laughs> for, for the oldest fans uh, of course the new albums are never as good as the first three you know it's like yeah. but that's that's okay you know that's okay for me they still love what we do today and you know i don't i don't care what favorite album they have <laughs> i just care that they are still around so yeah uh, and we still make you know contemporary music today that people that people count on and that we are you know we're still part of people's lives which is you know yeah it's it's just great yeah Hey, um, before we get deeper into Evergrey, um, I wanted, I, we've had Ariane on the show a couple of times. Uh, you were on uh, one of his records. I wanted just to ask you about the experience of working on, on that and working with him. Mm. Yeah, I mean, again, just a great honor to have people wanting you on their, in their music. Yeah. And that was the, very much the case with Ariane as well. I mean, and to be totally honest, just because they have really had released albums at that time of course that made it a bit more important for me you know also being in a, in the earlier days of my career but looking back at it now and and comparing it to participating on a like a 70 year old kids uh, guitar demo it's it's pretty much the same thing for me it's the same same type of experience you get to you get to create with somebody else which is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a gift that I never take for granted in my life, you know. And uh, yeah. and that was the thing with with uh, with the. I mean, this is so long ago now uh, with with Arian that I barely remember. But I mean, basically, I flew down to Holland and 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 uh, and uh, recorded the song in a day and flew home. But the other, like two years or one year ago, two years it must have been, the year before COVID, we we played a show in 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 Belgium in front of. I don't know, 50,000 people, I don't know, a lot of people uh, at the festival. So there I sort of reconnected with the whole Aryan thing. And we were supposed to do a show now this year as well, but I guess that's postponed. But yeah, all in all, a great, great honor and a great experience. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's talk just a little bit about Redemption. Um, mm -hmm. This is a group that you, uh, you joined basically replacing Ray Alder. Um, so one great voice to another great voice, uh, as I see it, because I'm, I'm, I think I have high regard for Ray as well. Um, yeah. When you joined, um, was there an expectation or opportunity that you would immediately participate in the songwriting component? No, maybe quite the opposite, to be honest. Uh, I, me and Nick, uh, the guitar player and founding member of the of the band, uh, we have been friends for. 20 years or so. And I said in a, in a moment of drinking red wine somewhere, I said, if you ever need a singer, I, I will be there. And, and then he got back to me in the worst sort of worst pack time of my life. <laughs> said, I need you now. So yeah, but I mean, it's also another great opportunity for me to be able to hang with one of my best friends and uh, create music uh, with him in terms of singing, but I never wanted it to be a, a a band where I started creating music for the actual band in that sense, because then it would, I, I guess, inevitably, it would start to sound like Evergrey or something else that yeah. I'm heavily involved with. So we made that distinction very early that you will keep on writing the music and I will come with, of course, production ideas and stuff like that. And in terms of vocals, of course, too. But uh, it's still, I would say, very much all of Nick's ideas and and I try to sort of execute his ideas in the best possible manner and uh, uh, you know to, to also try to get his ideas and and uh, and uh, his visions come to life in a sense yeah um that, you actually anticipated what I was going to ask because I was going to ask about how because <clears throat> the music is different how you approach it in order to um deliver that and so you, it sounds like you've answered that do we um i was kind of looking around a little bit it looks as though there's there some of the work for the an eighth redemption album is coming to a close is that is that right yeah I, i'm done <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i yeah it's it's i think we're starting mix we should have been starting mixing this week uh, but uh, something happened somewhere uh, somebody's scheduling uh, was uh, I don't know <laughs> whatever we start in we start in a week or two I guess so oh that's exciting do you have a sort of target date for release or is that too soon to know I don't know this to be honest I think that the record company business has, has has a lot of problems right now not being able to print vinyl albums I know this for a fact because some factory burnt down or whatever I don't know wow. and uh, so so uh, I think they have a long lead time up to when. If you want to release an album in June, the album has to be sort of ready now, you know. So it's like almost a year ahead of of time. You need to know what you're doing. So, uh, so I guess it's gonna be released like maybe April or something like that. Okay. Well, we'll watch for that. That's exciting. And you, when you, Definitely. when you, uh, when you r write for that, are you writing in Los Angeles? We, last album we did in Los Angeles for, and this album for obvious reasons we we couldn't so yeah, so yeah. We, we had this type of thing going this uh, zoom interaction and and uh, and uh, try to hammer it out but I mean basically as I said Nick delivers uh, his vocal lines and I try to improve what he has written as much as I can and uh, many of the things are exactly the way he wrote them and uh, a few of the things have been altered just by the way I sound, you know, yeah. and, uh, and if, and it's very challenging to sing, uh, Nick's things because it's talking about progressive. He is very progressive in his term of terms of vocal writing, which is uh, a big challenge for me. Yeah. 
Um, in a positive way. In a positive way. Is that is that? Can I just if I probe on that a little bit? Is it uh, when in progressive? In what way is it is it challenging? Is it because he's asking you to to um, do more athletic stuff up and down your range? Is it is it about different um, scales? Mostly, to move? yeah. Mostly ryth rhythmically, yeah. he starts on different timings than I do. Which is for a singer, it's you know you have your set of tools that you work with and you and you sing in that sort of way you know it's like you drive a car in a certain way you know yeah and all of a sudden if somebody would come and tell you you have to drive it in this way then it would be very difficult for you to sort of alter your driving skills but yeah. uh, that's also part of the challenge and but uh, and also of course it's an, in, in in different keys uh, and i i mean nick is also heavily heavily influenced by bands like Rush and, and uh, Peter Gabriel. And so it's a whole new world coming into my sort of vocal range that I have to sort of adapt to, which is, yeah. which is why I do this because that's, what's great about this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, part of what you regard about it is the challenge of it. Um, it's, it's great to hear a musician that's as seasoned as you are still pushing himself. Um, that's really yeah, man, if this is, this is what I do, this is, uh, and it's the most important thing I have uh, and got going for me really. So I, I take music dead seriously, even though I have a lot of fun doing it. So it's a, uh, it's very much, uh, it's very much a serious profession for me. Yeah. Well, good. That, that's a good transition to, um, Evergrey. Um, the, I don't want to rehash too much the writing process. I think this has been documented quite a bit. But it, if we just, in a thumbnail, it, it seems as though, uh, from what I've sort of gathered, you and Jonas um, do a, a lion's share of the writing up front, the songwriting, and then you bring that into the band and it gets sort of um, worked with the band into a final tune. Have I oversimplified that? No. I mean, I would say that when when we when we bring what we have, this is actually happening tomorrow for the new Evergrey album. What we're ex exactly what we're talking about right now uh, is that w when we the five of us have sat down and and gone through it and sort of throw thrown away all the ideas that we don't like and we have agreed on like a ten uh, like ten songs, and then we start to write th them together. That that's when it becomes an Evergrey song. Before that, it's all, it's either my ideas or Jonas's ideas or somebody else's ideas in the band. But it's only when it goes through all the, all the filters of the five of us that it becomes a song that sounds like Evergrey. I mean, of course, there are, will always be one song here and there that, 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 that is written by one person, but it still is okay by everyone. And it's, it, it's, uh, it has to be, yeah, it has to be okay by everyone. And not okay, even it has to be one of the songs that we feel really strongly about. If if it's not, then it's not gonna make the cut, you know. So yeah. Um, sonically, the in spending a lot of time across twelve albums, and there's always uh, exceptions to this. But one of the things that that strikes me about your music is it's very anthemic. Um, even when you've got um, a lot of movement in the rhythm section. Um, a lot of times the vocal lines that you'll 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 um, bring over the top that creates this and sometimes it's a consequence of chord progressions um, um, usually for me kind of surprising which is always delightful but it always has this quality like I would say 90 percent of the songs that I that I listen to and I listen to most of your catalog they have mm -hmm. this quality of, of being anthemic and what I mean by that is it's um, uh, it, it it sort of demands you sort of pay attention because um, something something substantive is going to be delivered. And I don't I know this sounds super high minded, but I actually love this about the music. And, and so I wanted to ask you if this this sonic sort of fingerprint that um, I'm tapping into here with Evergrey is is something that you conscious about, or if it's really just an artifact of you know the the writing process it's just who you guys are intrinsically yeah what you said last okay. basically we, i mean of course we have been formed and shaped into a mold that are us through 25 years of course that has an impact on 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 our, our on our sonic i mean on, on our sound 
basically that that uh, that automatically happen when the five of us are in the room. I mean, of course, we have changed members back and forth, and and this has also contributed to where we are today. Um, but if if we hadn't go through uh, gone through all of these changes and all of these ups and downs in in our career, we wouldn't have been sounding like this. We would have been sounding differently. But uh, it's not something that we sort of. I mean, of course, we're very conscious about the sounds that we choose for a keyboard uh, part or me, me and Jonas especially are extremely nerdy when it comes to comes to the production side of, of an album. Uh, and we have produced, I think, pretty much the last five albums or whatever it is. So, yeah, yeah. conscious on one level, but it's not deliberately. We're, we're, we're not tuning ourselves into now we have to sound more like this or we have to do it to to stay to 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 stay sort of true to our to our core you know it's yeah. like we 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 sound the way we do automatic that was my instinct um i know not all bands do it this do it the same way but that was my mm. instinct for how you guys have arrived at this very distinctive sound the other i mean and it, 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 i'm not trying to sort of um broad stroke the music but there is for me at least one other defining quality that seems to be uh, continuous through most of the music and I, I think I may have said this up front but it has a sort of what I call emotional quotient um, the some of this comes I think uh, as a consequence of you don't shy away from dealing with big themes heavy themes whether it's suicide or grief or loss or helplessness like things that um, you know, sort of like human conditions that that um, are challenging, uh, and so uh, and I know that on the most recent record, I watched an interview, and I want to ask you about this, where you feel like you shifted gears and and were looking at some of these things from a place of strength, but I wonder um, sort of the, the the melodies that you put to the music, and certainly the lyrics you put to the music carry this sort of gives it this emotional investment that I think is also part of what defines Evergrey. Is that some, is that likewise something that just comes as you are, you know, as it's coming out of you, um, emotion as a writer? I think it goes hand in hand with just writing about stuff that you have experienced yourself or, okay. you know, writing about, uh, uh, things that matter to you. Uh, I mean, there are a bunch of bands writing about Dungeons and Dragons, and I don't have that close relationship, you know, with a, with a dragon or a sword or a shield. So I leave that to people that do that better than me. But yeah. now, all kidding aside, I mean, there, there's a place for everything. I feel, and and for every grade, it's always been a, it's always been been about writing about myself, basically, and what I've, what I am experiencing, or what I have experienced, or or maybe a friend of mine have experienced somebody close to me, but it has to matter to me. If it, if it doesn't matter to me, how can it matter to somebody else listening to it? That's my sort of, you know, if you don't, don't get goosebumps listening to your own music, then nobody else would get goosebumps either. So, yeah. you know, it's the, that's the sort of starting point I try to have in, in, in but not, but not, I mean, not fabricating stuff either. I have to write about, and then it sounds like, yeah, you made 12 albums and uh, uh, we write, write about misery, you know, it's like, but that's also, that's also the case, you know, you, there's so many events in life that, that, that I find interesting dealing with, you know, yeah. uh, asking questions uh, too much. I mean, more rhetoric than, than anything else, really. I mean, it's about, it's, yeah, it's about me. It's easy for me to sort of, understand uh, and and it's easy for me to connect to a sentence uh when i sing about something that happened to me yeah well it, it makes um a lot of sense to me because i've always thought at least for me one of the re and i know that i'm not unique in this regard but one of the reasons that i'm so drawn to this style of music is it, it has this quality of helping you feel powerful uh, empowering you to a answer the needs and the the challenges of life, whatever those things are. So um, music that is sort of directly addressing itself to some of those challenges seems really like a uh, 
obvious, create courageous thing. Um, so you've married, I think, this desire to sort of look at situations that um, you've encountered and deal with them in a way that um, I don't know. It's, I don't want to. I don't want to say it's therapeutic, although maybe it is. But it is definitely um, giving you some power in relationship to them, and the and the 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 beauty of that is you're uh, you're kind of giving that to your audience because your audience is hearing you deal with that stuff. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the scary part of it because when I sit down here and write about stuff, I have no no sort of conscience uh, telling me that this is going to be played for the rest of the world. I, I just, I, I write what I have in my mind at that moment and the thoughts that go through my brain at that moment. And that is sort of very, how shall I put it? I'm not taking care of myself that much in that aspect, because then, then I would be trying to sort of, then, then I would be trying to, to, to write my lyrics in a different way that is kinder to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm too revealing in some in some in some lyrics. I also write about family stuff that and uh, and did not take into consideration that I have siblings that might not see it the way that I do, you know. And and then I sort of give it to the world, and the rest of the world can write about my inner ideas. And that hits me sometimes when I, damn, I'm standing up here and singing about these things, you know. It's like, but yeah, I guess that I guess that's that's. That's what it, it's. Uh, that's how it ha has to be for me in order to do what I do. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think the fans. I can't speak for all of them, but I think many of them um, are cognizant of this, and I think that they love the sort of openness uh, that you've shared in as you've written about these things. And because you write, even if they didn't know or don't know, in some instances that you're writing about personal experiences or feelings about things. Um, I think that their um, soul or whatever we want to call the, the the inside, I think resonates with it. I think it sounds honest to them. I think there there's a commiseration, um, which I think from from that people draw power. Um, and I think it's why once fans find you, they they um, they remain fans because this music kind of has this emotional quotient that not all heavy metal does. And I'm not I'm not trying to throw shade on other styles of metal. It, it all sure. has a place, whether it's just of for the course. pure entertainment or thrill or party. That's all good stuff. Um, but I love that there's a band like Evergrade that kind of sits in the midst of them that is is not a, not 100%, but in large part addressing itself to some of these important topics. Um, yeah, and I mean, and, and I think it's, uh, if anything, that's my sort of contribution to the world. I I try to sort of put light on on themes and and about situations that people are often scared to talk about, you know. Yeah. And I have another band called Silent Skies, which which is just me and a and a, a, a guy called Vikram Shankar. We 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 have released one album, which is just basically piano and vocals. And and we just recorded our our second album now, uh, and that's even more sort of to the point and up close and naked in that sense. And yeah, it's not. I'm not doing it to challenge myself. I don't want to try to sort of write the coolest, most emotional type of lyrics. I just again, I just write whatever comes to mind, and yeah. it's more. It's more like sporadic thoughts of fragmented ideas that I have in my head that goes on. And, and then I try to sort of make that into a story. So yeah. that make, you know, is comprehensible. Yeah. No, I, I, what you're describing there, I think is um, not dissimilar with other artists who um, have sure spl splinters of ideas and, and lyrical ideas that they sort of bring to fruition through the songwriting process. Um, yeah. It's sort of a magical thing to marry music with language, uh, and it's not always something you can articulate. Um, um, I, under I I totally get it, but but the the result, I guess, is what I'm saying. The result is something that I think is unique and um, has this sort of special place inside the larger pantheon of metal music. Um, yeah. 
I wanted to ask you, uh, we don't have to go through it line by line, but you did over uh, prior to uh, Escape the Phoenix, you had a sort of trilogy of sorts. It was What was the sort of um, unifying idea narratively between those three records? Uh, it started with me f- uh, finding out about myself that I, that I n- all of a sudden knew I couldn't go on living the life that I lived at that time. And, and that's, was a very slow process. As you said, it's three albums. So it, it was actually about me leaving my ex-wife. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, and I put that, and that's the cool thing about the lyric side of things, finding out that this is not me anymore. I have to do something else. I, I, I know I have to, you know, bring myself from this position that I am, am in today. And no matter what. I, I know I have to leave, basically. Uh, but, but again, very slow process and, and a process that sort of went through all the different dynamics of uh, anger and sorrow and, and, and frustration, of course, and, and everything in between as well. Uh, so, so, yeah, that was the it's describing seven years of my life, basically. Wow. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, I don't know what that would be like, but that I, I have to believe that that brought up some stuff uh, sure. in the songwriting. Um, and so at, that, at the same time, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not overly crystal clear about what I'm writing about since you, you I mean, you asked, so yeah, yeah. it's not like, it's not that obvious, but, but when, 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 when people ask, I have to, I have to answer truthfully because otherwise it, it wouldn't mean anything to myself either. So. Yeah. And I'm in a great place today. And so is my ex-wife. So it's, you know, all is good, yeah. but it's still, I th- think it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a, yeah. Challenging is one word. It was a challenging experience knowing that you started writing on something that could become one album, but then it just kept on going and, and going. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's almost a life's work in a, in a sense. Yeah, it's a cool document. And I mean, even if the Escape of the Phoenix is not, it's not the fourth chapter, but but it really is. It really yeah. is. It's describing where I am today, coming from a place of strength and, and pride of who I become in life, basically. So yeah, no, I actually love that. I love that um, um, so much of your emotional journey is infused in in those records, um, even if it's not one for one. Uh, even if it's metaphorical at times, I think that that's, um, it's a cool document you've got forever now of that period of time that you were working through that stuff. Um, and that's something that I discovered for, for the, the, I mean, all of the albums that they are, they are describing where I was at the time, at the same time as I'm writing about specific subjects, of course, but yeah. they are also mirroring my sort of emotional state at the time, uh, which is, yeah, so it's like an emotional diary of, of, and I have it, you know, written down. So some of the lyrics I write, and it's like, damn, I'm telling myself here that this is going to happen, or that I'm feeling like this, and you know, yeah. which is very, very powerful in a in a sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and the 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 beauty of it is, as you work through that stuff yourself, that my this is my personal opinion, but I think the human experience is. Uh, similar enough across people that when you talk about your childhood or some working through grief or whatever it is, it's it. A lot of people can resonate to it. Like sure. they find everybody. Everybody has it. something, you know. Yeah. That that and that's just the thing that when you realize that that everybody's gone through something that sort of burdens them or, or you know yeah. whatever it might be. It, it, that's also encouraging in a way. And that's one of the things that I hope that Evergrey sort of supplies for people. It's a, a sense of not being alone in a, in a way, you know? So, and yeah. you know, if we, if we accomplish that to 100 people, then it's, then I've done my part, you know, it's, yeah. that's, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> no, I think that that's actually, um, as we're sitting here talking about it, I think that's really powerful. I think yeah. the nature of Evergrey music um, gives your fans this like this focus point of hope 
because it's a uh, it's a place where they know um, they're hearing something that's honest, uh, that's representing um, all all kinds of different challenges in life. Um, not sure. that that's not all that you do, but you certainly have a strength in this kind of songwriting, and I think it's it's um, um, it gives them some hope. I honestly, I think it gives them some hope um, that, that, that yeah. there are people that understand this. Like sometimes that's all you need is just to, to be heard. And I mean, sure, the the music sounds, uh, you know, dark and sad and and heavy. Uh, but for many people, that is not a that is not a sort of it's not a weight right. <laughs> you put on yourself. You, you get empowered by listening to exactly right. things that resonate within you. You know, um, uh, I was talking to Floor Jansen of Nightwish. We had a conversation very much like this right in this studio, here. and we were talking about how how this how we don't connect with the happy type of music. We don't get empowered by that. We get empowered by this. We feel strength by, you know, singing and debating topics and subjects that are that are heavy, but not because we want to dwell in in misery, rather the opposite, you know. Exactly right. Yeah, I think that it's important. I think that there, there are plenty of songs that have basically repeated the idea that darkness shows you the light. Um, mm. And I think your a lot of your music does that. And they're very powerful um, moments, especially on the most recent record, where acknowledging that is um, gives you some sort of power over it. Um, yeah. As you did, I one of your interviews that I I looked at, you talked about the idea that looking, you were in some cases looking back at things from a, a power a, a pos- perspective of strength. Now, hmm. um, yeah, very much so. The the um, I wanted to ask you just about a couple of them. Your the dandelion cipher, uh, I believe I heard you said was sort of about your childhood. Um, it, can you say more about that? And there's actually a saying, a, da- a, a dandelion child in Swedish is, is sort of a psychological term for for kids who who got to take care of themselves when they were growing up in a sense, and that might be not that you don't get fed, but that you're may maybe that you're feeling emotionally on your own, you know. I got it. Uh, so yeah, so that song is about that feeling, feeling alone, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then you, there's another song there I have to ask you about called "Stories" that um, I heard you mention has something to do with the degree to which, as a society, we tell we tell this version of ourselves to everybody who looks at us on social media that may not be a true reflection of who we are or how we're feeling. Um, Yeah. Is that, is that like, I love, I I love the boldness of that because I think everybody knows that nobody is always so happy as they are on social media. Um, But you, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all contributors to, to, to painting pictures that are false. Yeah. At the same time, Instagram or whatever it wouldn't be big if people put out pictures of their misery. You know, <laughs> that would be sort of shut down for <laughs> within a week. But but at the same time, we have to also be conscious about the fact that the world isn't looking like a big, you know, vacation at all times. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, it's um at the same time as you know putting up videos and pictures of instruments and it inspires people, it, you know, and that's how I would love to see it working only not, you know, not that you have to sort of reface your face because you're not happy with how you look, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I have something of a, of a similar view on a lot of the social media stuff. It's not a place you go to commiserate because that kind of interactions almost got to be face to face, you know, a, a real, a real exchange. Yeah. Um, but I, I've thought that very thing myself is the, the number of, in my, my social feeds are these people literally so, so often just upbeat and have no problems. And obviously not. Um, yeah, but good for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but I guess you're right. We wouldn't want to read a feed of all of the tragedy. There's enough of that on the news, I guess. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a what do you call it? Double-sided sword. Yeah, it's. Yeah. It, I think you need the balance in a sense, and uh, there are people out there making a difference through social media as well, of course. So it's not all bad. It's not. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that maybe be be aware of what kind of picture you're painting and and also let people know that this is not the only truth you know <laughs> yeah 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 you're not one so unidimensional hey one of the tracks in this on the last record that i i love because i'm a big fan of his too is um beholder uh because mm. i'm a big fan of james labrie he's actually a friend of mine yeah um in fact i had him sing a song on my record uh and so i know a oh, little great. bit yeah, I know a little bit about the feeling of getting to hear him sing something you've wrote and written. Um, but that that's a beautiful song. I love how you actually used him and his voice to tell that story. It's really well done. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I've also known James for, for a good while. I wouldn't say we're friends, but we're friendly colleagues, at least. We've known each other for, I mean, Dream Theater was one of the reasons why I started Evergrey and, and, and you know, and then we sort of met through 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 life, basically, on festivals and on tours and whatever. So it's we also opened for him on his first solo tour. Oh, uh, nice. So yeah, so yeah, so he's he, he we go way back in that sense. And then we had this song uh, demo of this song, and then I sort of heard I heard his voice in my head, basically, and I, and I said we should. And before I knew who it was, I said we should have a we should have a guest on this song. And we were the five of us were in the room, and, and everybody were like, "Yeah, who?" <laughs> and then pretty much everyone realized at the same time it should be James, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I asked him, and and he, I mean, of course, he wanted to hear the the actual music, and I said I will write it uh, the way that I love to hear you sing, and. Uh, I mean, it was very easy for me because I, it's been a voice in my musical upbringing in a sense. So, so, so I, I know where, I, how I love to hear him, you know, yeah. and I got to write that for him, which is also extremely a big honor. And, and he, he executed it fantastically. I think it's a great, great duet of us, to be honest. Yeah. I'm very I really proud do. of it. I agree a hundred percent. I think it's um, the melding of your voices and the, and even, even lyrically the choices you make, where you have him doing the, you know, the, the storytelling. Yeah. Uh, it's all very thought to me. It's all very thoughtfully done. I, I love the result. Um, th and so, and it, you know, just to kind of, kind of bring it all together, you know, across the 12 albums, um, I think it's true both as in industry recognition, fan growth, maturity of writing, Evergrey is getting stronger. And this, this last record I think was just so strong track to track. Um, not, not simply of course, because of James Labrie. I actually think that the, the, the level where Evergrey is, um, it, it, I mean, it, it made it probably very easy for James to say yes. Cause, um, the music is so good. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, I know that you guys just got picked up on by Napalm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you're, I think you're, you're actually already are about to start tracking your next record. Is that right? Well, not tracking, but we're, we, we, we're heavy into writing individually. As I said before, we, we, tomorrow we will meet and, oh, and start right. the actual going through the first batch of, of material, which is always very fun to see what, what, <laughs> where we are at, you know? What, what our mindset is and if we're at the same same place you know yeah we usually are not but we end up in the same place at the end so <laughs> that's the cool thing about it yeah so i'm very much looking forward to that and yes a new new label with napalm i think it's uh, uh i don't think you should stay at the same place for too long i think it sort of makes you stagnate and you know it gets too comfortable you have to have some edge in in terms of marketing and, and new ideas and new people coming in. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, is the, um, are, is the whole band co-located? I mean, are you all live close enough that you can all get together? Yeah. I mean, basically, I mean, uh, Johan is the only guy that sort of lives in another area of Sweden. He lives in Stockholm and we live in Gothenburg on the West coast. So, 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 uh, it, it's a, 
three hour train ride for him to to get here but i mean oh yeah that's easy easy enough yeah um well that's exciting do you guys uh have any sort of projection on timing or it's just whenever you finish it i we have a very strong projection on timing but i can't tell you because okay. it's a it's a label thing sure no, no problem sooner uh, sooner sooner than you think okay that's good to hear and you guys yeah. do have some tour dates i saw published um yeah. mostly european yeah yeah and i think i mean honestly i i don't see that happening the way the world is functioning right now uh it's a it's too much hassle and too much money to sort of in europe where there are different rules in every in every country it's gonna be you know it's like touring the states there are different laws in different states you know yeah. it's it's just gonna be a hassle uh we have a we have crew that are from different parts of the world you know it's like uh, i i i don't i am not overly enthusiastic about it i am enthusiastic if we were if we got to play but i i I'm, I'm i don't think this will happen yeah i it's um the same thing's happening here we've got states that are fully open um uh, you don't need to you know th there's mandates for masks and not and not there's mandates for vaccine and not and depending on which state you're in all of those laws are different um so i don't know like any band coming through the states it would be a nightmare having to do tour routing um, i have a friend who's uh, the drummer of uh, i mean it's actually our drummer it's my best friend hannes he plays drums in sabaton and they're touring with judas priest uh, i think they're leaving in like 10 days or so mm -hmm. and i'm like Dude, I'm so happy I'm not in your band because uh, I, I I don't understand how this will work at all. I mean, it's a and I guess that's pretty big places as well in the U.S. So yeah, I've got a ticket to the the priest. I live in Seattle. I've got a, a ticket to their show. Um, yeah. And but I, I I'm like you. I don't have a lot of confidence. Um, the way that the things are rolling, that this isn't going to be another set of um, tours that just get pushed out. Yeah, but also, you know, just getting into your countries, it's a hassle to yeah. start with. You know? Yeah, that's and, right. And now, phew, I don't know. Well, 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 let's see. We'll see. <laughs> well, we'll hope that things go well. Um, is there, is there, uh, I mean, assuming that things don't get shut down, do you have plans to take the tour on a later leg to these to the States? Or is it just of course i mean we, we that's always our plan okay uh, i mean now, now given the the state of the world we figured it was smarter to make another album than just sit and wait you know uh so yeah but for sure uh, uh i know also that napalm has some touring agencies starting up in the us as well but also bad timing i i, I yeah. guess right now but you know yeah so yeah let's just use the time we have and make music instead of playing it live and whenever it's time we're gonna be you know firing on all cylinders with the you maybe can't answer this question but it, will the the forthcoming record become more conceptual the way some of the prior records have no idea yet to be honest okay i'm i'm, I'm sitting here with my 10 ideas right now and tomorrow i will hear 40 more ideas of of songs and and then we sort of hammer it out and we, we will see where we're at. So, yeah. Okay, good. Well, I have one, uh, one last question for you um, that I ask all, all of my guests. And that is, is there another mountain that you want to climb? And it could be creative, could be um, some sort of other creative endeavor, could be completely non-creative, but something you've always wanted to do, but just haven't had time yet to do. Yeah, I mean, there are many things that I want to do, but I wanted to get an academic degree and I did that during, you know, also being a musician at the same time touring and, I st you know, well, studied for five and a half years at the same time as being a musician. Wow. So, so I did that. And now, and now, I mean, I think, I basically think that my, that it's only creative musical ideas that I want to sort of, I have this, as I said, the Silent Skies albums that I want people to hear because it's, I would say that it's as heavy and as dark as, and as melodic as, as anything else that I write, but it's without 
the heavy drums and without the heavy guitars, uh, which is, but feels just as heavy as anything else in, in my world. You know? So I want to see that grow and I'm extremely sort of eager to, to have people hear that. So yeah, we'll that's one of the uh, things. What, is, is there a website we can point people to for that uh, group? Yeah, I mean, there's one album out. You can just check it on your, whatever you listen to your music uh website we have the facebook only i think okay is there so, um sounds like then there's definitely more albums in that project that, that are going to come no we, we have done one released one and uh, we've just finished the second one that we're releasing next year so next year is going to be crazy because it's going to be uh redemption first i think and then it's going to be the silent skies album in somewhere during the spring as well and then it's going to oh i almost slipped don't, don't say it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but but so three three new albums from you next year. That's a busy year. Yeah, I had four this year, so it's. <laughs> oh wow! Did you really? Yeah. What were the four? No, I mean writing, writing. Oh oh yes, writing. Yeah, well that's a. Will you do? Will there be some live dates for Redemption that you'll do? Wouldn't know. Uh, right now, I, I mean, right now, Nick is so busy professionally with his sort of uh, other job too. Uh, so, so it's all up to him basically. All right. Well, Tom, it's been, uh, an honor to get to talk to you. Thanks for taking some time. Um, you, thank you I'm, for having me. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we have you as a musician and songwriter in the metal community, because I think, um, I think you occupy this very unique space and give us this sort of very unique and powerful music that that um allows allows and this is again this isn't all that you do it's certainly a, a, a central part of your your work allows people to find a sort of empowerment relative to um you know tough topics and themes um and you do it like i said and this is my language but you do it with a music that's so anthemic i think this is the reason it it feels so empowering um and uh, you know so I love it, and I want, I'm I'm glad that it's you've had 25 years, and that you your career's on an, uh, a continual up uh, incline. Yeah, very very slow incline. <laughs> you can barely see it, but it's 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 going up. It's there. And you the band's gonna happen. make it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what will happen though, man? Is you'll yeah. write a song, and you won't know what that song will be, and all of a sudden it would just be huge. And then it'll be like, so. you know, half the planet will be, Hey, are these guys new? <laughs> exactly. I, I I'll gladly take that success right now. That would be great for me economically to have a one song now when having 12 albums in the back catalog. Yeah. Yeah. That that's a good, that'd be good. <laughs> all right, my friend. Hey, if you will um, stick on the line so I can say a personal goodbye. Um, but I'll play the outro for for our stream friends, and then um, and then later we'll of course put this up elsewhere so folks can watch uh, on demand. Thanks for having me. Yeah, take care. Bye.